we're looking at management practices through a lens of productivity, right? And so we were hoping that there might be a relationship between the productivity and the management practices. Less st structured management practices adopting firms have lower productivity than those with more structured management practices. I'm Lucia Foster um, at the Census Bureau. I'm the chief of the Center for Economic Studies, and I'm the chief economist of the Census Bureau. And as somebody at the Census Bureau, I just want to make sure that I say that everything I'm going to talk about today is just my opinion and not the Census Bureau's. So a lot of people think about the Census Bureau, they think about the demographic data that we collect. So they think about the decennial census, or they might think about the current population survey, or they might think about the American Community Survey. But the Census Bureau actually collects a lot of information about businesses. Every five years, we conduct an economic census, and we have a number of other surveys that are about businesses. So it's really important that we have economists that work at the Census Bureau that can put the data through its paces, using that data to see if there's any gaps in the data, or if there's other parts of the economy that we're missing that we should be talking about, or if there's ways to improve the data that we already have. So as an economist at the Census Bureau, I started out using uh, the Census Bureau's business data for my dissertation to look at adjustment costs at manufacturing plants. So if it gets hit by a, a shock, how does a manufacturing plant adjust its employment or other things that it might be doing in, in response to a shock? Right now, most of my work focuses on productivity dynamics. So obviously, productivity is a really important uh, determinant of how an economy is doing. It drives a standard of living. So what I've been looking at is the productivity of firms and how that impacts aggregate productivity growth. So one thing people might not know about the Census Bureau is when we have all this microdata about businesses, we can understand some of the things behind the aggregate statistics that you might be aware of. So for instance, Bureau of Labor Statistics produces the official statistics on productivity at the aggregate or industry level. But underneath those aggregate statistics, there's some really interesting differences. For instance, the manufacturing sector, and you see productivity growth over a certain time period, you might say to yourself, OK, was that all the businesses in manufacturing are getting a little bit more productive? Or is there differences in businesses uh, in the manufacturing sector? And as it turns out, there's really important differences. So within the manufacturing sector, there's some businesses that are very productive, and there's some that are less productive. And what we see is that aggregate productivity growth reflects the reallocation of economic activity from less productive to more productive businesses. And so some of that might be happening because a less productive business is dying out, or a new business comes in and it's more productive, but a lot of it's actually just the movement of economic activity from less productive existing businesses to more productive businesses. And I think one question that people have about this is, why are there less productive businesses that are able to stay in business for so long? And that's a really interesting question. Um, and the differences we're talking about are huge. Within the manufacturing sector, the difference between a business at the most uh, productive end of the distribution is about four times that of a business at the less, less productive end of the distribution. So a lot of the work that I've been doing for years is trying to understand um, why there are these productivity differences. So one of the reasons that management and productivity go together is that there's a lot of differences in businesses about their productivity. Some are very high productivity and some are very low productivity. And so this is a natural question like, well, why is this? Um, and why does it persist over time? So there's a lot of different reasons why it might persist over time. But we think that maybe one of them is management practices. And for the Census Bureau, one of the reasons why this was a mystery is that we have been collecting information about a lot of information about manufacturing plants for years through the annual survey of manufacturers, where we collect information on like capital and labor and energy and materials and detailed information about outputs. But we didn't have any information about a very important component of any economic activity, which is the management portion of it. So you know, we were interested in this, and we were very lucky because we were uh, contacted by some outside researchers, Nick Bloom and John Van Rienen, who've been working on understanding management and, and at businesses for years. So they've had like a very long research agenda to look at this. And they are also interested in management practices through the lens of productivity. So management is a very complicated uh, concept. You can think of many different dimensions of management practices. Um, but they were looking at it through a productivity lens. And so they were looking more at process-oriented management practices rather than like strategic management practices, which would be about maybe things like um, pricing or innovative activities or mergers and acquisitions. Instead, they were interested in process-oriented management practices. For instance, things like, do you set key performance indicators? 
Does the business have targets that it tries to set? When it's trying to motivate its employees, does it do that through promotions and bonuses? So while management's a very broad topic, we narrowed it down to this focus about management practices associated with potential productivity growth, and then we did a huge study looking at the impact of productivity and management practices. As part of the work on productivity and management, um, we were able, the Census Bureau was able to partner with outside researchers to conduct a survey that we call the Management and Organizational Practices Survey. It has 16 questions on it about management practices. And because we're trying to look at it through a productivity lens, we, we narrowed it down to three areas, which is monitoring, targeting, and incentives. So monitoring is whether or not you collect key performance indicators, how often you collect them, who looks at them. Um, targeting is when you set a target for the um, manufacturing plant. Is it easy to reach? Is it hard to reach? And are the workers aware of it or is only senior management? And then for incentives, when there's promotions and bonuses, are they tied to your own work or the work of your plant or maybe your team or the firm? And so looking at all of those practices, what we did was we developed the survey that we put first in the United States um, and we sent it out to 50,000 manufacturing plants, first in 2010, then in 2015, and then in 2021. The work that I'm gonna be talking about is about when we did it for 2015. Um, and from that, that served as a prototype. The US Census Bureau's work with these outside researchers served as a prototype for other countries to adopt these questions. And we were very fortunate. Um, the team worked with many different uh, individuals in different countries, and we had 13 other countries participate. From that, we have an enormous data set that actually is not all together. It's 14 separate pieces, but it tells us about management practices in each of the 14 countries. And from that, we noticed some interesting patterns, and those became the three natural laws of management. And so when I say natural laws, of management, you might be thinking, well, natural laws usually refer to ethics, or there might be laws of nature, which usually refers to hard sciences. And here, it's sort of an inspirational or aspirational title, where we're looking at patterns that appear across all the countries that are um, driven by like a huge empirical data set, but patterns that we see that are universal across the countries. So uh, we found three of them. And they are uh, ones about heterogeneity, ones about scale, and ones about outcomes. So for heterogeneity, what we found was that within any country, the adoption of management practices, and here I mean structured management practices, which are when I say about monitoring targets and incentives, that the practices that you do for these are more formal, more frequent, more specific, and more explicit. So I gave an example before about a question about incentives. And I said, you know, how are bonuses decided for, let's take example, managers in this plant. How do you decide who gets a bonus for our managers? And one of the answers might be, well, we don't give bonuses. So, okay, that would be a very non-structured management practice. Or it could be that, well, the bonus depends on how the company's doing. Also not quite as structured, but if it's something like for the person themselves, rather than the team that they work on, then that's very specific to what's going on for that person. And so their bonus is very much tied to their own work. It's not tied to the work of the team that they're on, the plant that they're in, or the company that they're in. So we look at all the plants uh, that answered the survey in each of the 14 countries. And for each of them, when they answer the 16 questions, for those that answered with uh, less structured practices, each question gets a zero. If they have more structured, it gets a one. And then there's values in between it. And so, for instance, if you think about it, every business has a 16 scores. We take those scores, take an average, and that's how structured their management practices are. So they have a number between zero and one. And so when we look at the distribution of all these adoptions of management practices within a country, we see that they're very dispersed, right? You might think, well, if it's the best practice, everybody would be concentrated on, but it's actually not the best practice for everybody. And it's also the case that not everybody knows about these best practices. There might be informational barriers why they don't know about it, or there might be reasons why they can't adopt it. Maybe they don't have the resources to adopt it. Maybe the workforce isn't such that they can adopt it. So there's many reasons why they might not adopt these practices. But the main point is that the first law is that in, within any country, there's enormous variation within the, with the adoption of these structured management practices. So that's the first thing that we look at. The second thing is, so do these uh, differences in structured management matter, right? And so one of the ways that we think about they matter is, do they impact the scale of the business, right? So here we look at the correlation between the structured management practices 
and the size of the business. And so we have two measures of scale, um, employment, which is an input, and then revenues, which is an output. And what we find is, over all the countries, generally speaking, we see a positive relationship between structured management practices and the scale of the business. In the US, it's so large that uh, businesses that are at the least structured decile of management practices as compared to the most structured management practices, the ones at the higher end are six times larger than those in the smaller end. And the differences for revenue are even larger. There's a positive relationship, and it could be what I kind of talked about, which is there's a reallocation. More structured uh, businesses may be more productive, so they might get more and more economic activity flowing to them, so they go larger. So that would be one story. But another story could be, well, it's actually not that at all. It's that large businesses actually have the resources to be able to adopt these more structured management practices. Or it could be a third thing entirely, which is that it's neither that it's one causing the other. It could be the third factor. For instance, having a more skilled workforce may mean that you're more likely to be a large manufacturing plant, and it may also mean that you're more able to have more structured management practices. So that's, you know, part of the second law is that there's more uh, more structured management practices, businesses tend to be larger, but there's not a story of causality there. It's a correlation. There's a positive correlation. And then the last law concerns another outcome, set of outcomes, and these are a little bit more driven towards what a business is looking at. So they're about productivity and profitability and exports. So starting with productivity, we find that if you look at the deciles of structured management practices from the least structured management practices, again, to the most structured management practices, the plants uh, adopting those, we see that there's a positive relationship over those deciles with productivity. So less st structured management practices adopting firms have lower productivity than those with more structured management practices. Again, it's not a story about causality. It's a question about correlations. But what we find really interesting is this, of course, is that we, at the beginning, I've been talking about how we're looking at management practices through a lens of productivity, right? And so we were hoping that there might be a relationship between the productivity and the management practices. And so we see this positive relationship and we see it over all the countries. Why I'm interested in productivity is productivity is a really big driver of the living standards for any country. And so understanding when there's impediments to productivity growth, what holds firms back from achieving the frontier of productivity is really important to help us understand any impediments that we might have to improving our standard of living. Peel that back a little bit, see what's happening with productivity. When you peel that back a little bit further, it's driven by a lot by uh, productivity at businesses. And then so a central question is, what's helping businesses achieve uh, getting to the productivity frontier?